We will hear argument this morning in case 195807, Edwards versus Vinoy. Mr. Belanger? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, a verdict by 11 is no verdict at all. It's a line from the court earlier this year that ended Louisiana's non-unanimous jury scheme. On paper, it restored the full breadth of the Sixth Amendment's jury trial right to Louisianans. But we need to place the effect of this ruling into perspective. This laudable ruling would only apply to cases then pending or recently adjudicated. It meant nothing to Mr. Edwards, who was serving a life sentence at Angola for a verdict that would be illegal everywhere else, since Louisiana is the only place that would jail you for natural life on a non-unanimous verdict. Ultimately, the question before the court is why should the Sixth Amendment mean something less to Mr. Edwards? Members of the Ramos court were divided on how to reconcile the fractured decision in Apodaca with then existing precedent. This division cleared two paths to holding that Ramos applies retroactively under Teague, two paths for providing a remedy to those jailed by a jury scheme we know was morally wrong at its inception and is unconstitutional. For some justices, Apodaca was dead on arrival since its deciding vote's rationale was foreclosed by precedent. For these justices, Apodaca provided no precedential value, and Ramos is an old rule dictated by precedent precedent that simply restored the Sixth Amendment's full measure, either through the Due Process Clause or the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. For other justices, Apodaca was such a wrongly decided decision that it needed to be explicitly overruled. For these members of the court, Ramos should be a watershed rule requiring retroactivity as this restores fairness and accuracy to jury trials in Louisiana. Both paths remedy something we all know to be wrong. Both paths will provide the promise of a fair trial to all Louisianans. Mr. Chief Justice, I'm ready to entertain questions from the court. Uh, Thank you, counsel. Um, I I think you're Biggest hurdle um, is uh, the court's decision in Di, Di Stefano, um, where we held that the jury trial right itself uh, should not be applied retroactively. What, what we're talking about here uh, is a subordinate uh, right uh, to a unanimous verdict, a, a lesser included right. Um, how, do you, how do you get around uh, Di Stefano? Uh, There's two considerations I would like to bring to the uh, court's attention. Um, Di Stefano itself was just dealing with the uh, judge's ability to make a decision. And as this court noted in Duncan, you cannot say um, whether or not necessarily that a judge-rendered decision is more or less accurate than a um, jury-rendered decision. Our case here deals with the intricacies of what goes on in the jury room. I will also note that I think the more analogous case, Mr. Chief Justice, is the Brown decision. It, too, provided the same retroactivity standard that was um, incorporated um, in DiStefano, which relied heavily on state interest, and that decided to apply the Birch decision retroactively, which um, prevented Louisiana from having non-unanimous petty juries. You know, in Ramos... um Five of us uh, uh, thought that Apodaca was uh, a precedent that was being overruled, and therefore uh, it was the most compelling evidence that it was a new rule. Um, Were those five justices unreasonable? Well, when we get to the reasonableness standard of of, of the jurists, it's an objective um, criterion. I think that we can all agree that the Sixth Amendment requires a unanimous jury and that we can all agree um, that the Bill of Rights are fully incorporated to the states at this point. Normally, um, the reasonable jurist standard goes hand in hand with being dictated by precedent. But Apodaca was such a bizarre decision that it broke those two hands apart. And that's why it is in a unique universe of one, Mr. Chief Justice. I think, uh, particularly given your answer on Di Stefano, uh, that, that you have something of a burden of establishing that the uh, unanimous jury is is necessary uh, uh, to avoid you know, an impermissibly large uh, risk of an inaccurate uh, uh, conviction. What, what is your best uh, empirical evidence for that? Well, I have two. Um, first, 
is uh, we have uh, Amiki have provided some statistics on the actual exoneration coming out of Louisiana. Of the 65 or so cases that they've identified, half of those cases were eligible for a non-unanimous verdict, and from that population of half, half of those, or one quarter of the 65, were actual exonerations of non-unanimous jury verdicts. I would also turn the court's attention to a law review article um, published in Notre Dame after Gideon versus Wainwright was decided, written by Abe Crash. It's the right to a lawyer, the implications of Gideon versus Wainwright. Um, Crash was the, uh, one of the brief authors in Gideon, and he reported data in that that Florida at that time had about 8,000 people in jail, um, and 4,500 of those were jailed um, without a lawyer. And, and, and so the, the system accounted for that. If, if Gideon's going to be our watershed rule, we, we can look to see just the, the numbers there, and they're radically different from what we have here. And, and so you, you have a system where we look to see whether or not the system itself was fair. And the non-unanimous jury is not fair because it flies in uh, the historical tradition of this country. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Justice Thomas? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, counsel, we agree this is a, unlike Montgomery, this is a uh, procedural rule. So can you, other than Gideon, can you think of another case where we have said that a uh, procedural rule was retroactive? Well, not since Teague. Um, but when we go back to the Brown decision, that was applied. That was applying Birch retroactively, and it dealt with the same issue of unanimity in the Louisiana jury trial. Uh, the um, on your uh, statistics that you or the uh, data uh, that you just suggested about unanimous versus non-unanimous juries. How do you respond to the arguments on the other side that the uh, statistics and the studies are a mixed bag and really doesn't move the dial very much? one way or the other. Well, we have to look at whether or not the process seems fair. Our tradition puts together the reasonable doubt and the unanimous jury together. We want people to come together as a community to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that this person needs to be deprived of their liberty. And, and, and so uh, there, there are studies that suggest that the effectiveness of deliberation is simply cut short when you don't have to have a unanimous jury, and that systemically leads to the possibility of an inaccurate conviction. When we go back to those um, Gideon numbers out of Florida I just mentioned, I mean, certainly not all of the 4,500 people would have been convicted, but we're talking about more than half of the population in the jail at that time. It leaves room for the premise that the system can be inaccurate and unfair even though it may, in, in, in many instances, lead, lead to conceivably the right decision. But I don't know how you can tra how it translates uh, uh, right to counsel versus uh, unanimous jury. What has the court said? Uh, what have we said in our cases about non-unanimous juries? Well, um, going back to the Brown decision, it was required that. You know, Birch and Brown both required unanimous juries. And we've had Apodaca on the book for, books for quite some time. I think uh, the cases we have uh, actually, if not endorsed, it certainly uh, saw it sitting comfortably, if, uh, if not awkwardly, with our case law. Um, I would re respectfully disagree with that. While this court has acknowledged uh, Apodaca, for quite some time. I do not believe that Apodaca was used for what it's being argued to stand for, and that's we're going to have a watered-down Bill of Rights. Um, you know, let me it, ask it, you, let me change uh, a bit, let, go a little bit different direction. Let's assume that uh, the court finds that uh, this is retroactive. How do you get around the um, uh, relitigation bar in 2254-D1 of ADPA. Sure, I, I have uh, two points to make on that. First, if the court were just simply to decide retroactivity and save for another day any procedural objections, this case will go back down to the Louisiana courts where we will have 
a, a viable claim to make on state post-conviction. Secondly, um, when we go down to a – well, first of all, I don't necessarily agree that there was a decision on the merits, for starters, for purposes of D-1. But even if the court were inclined to think there was, when we go to E-2A subsection 1, um, new rules made retroactively by the United States Supreme Court would allow petitioners like Mr. Edwards to get in under a different um, portion of ADEPA. So, you know, I don't think when you can read those two statutes together that they should, it, it really necessarily poses a problem. Thank you. Justice Breyer? Um, thank you. How, how many approximate, what's your rough estimate of if you win? Uh, how many new trials in Louisiana uh, will be called for? At, at this point, we believe the maximum population is 1,600 people. I do not believe that all of those 1,600 people will be able to establish that they had a non-unanimous jury. Um, I think Amiki did a good job breaking down the statistics, and it's probably closer to 1,000. And from that, there's different subsets. Some of these people will either be eligible for parole soon um, or they will benefit from a change on the habitual offender law or they are also in jail for a very significant unanimous jury conviction. And can the Louisiana system handle that? Oh, yes, sir. Um, I mean, we're only talking about... How, how many trials are there in a year in, in Louisiana? Or I don't know... Th- I do not know the exact number. That varies by jurisdiction, but I believe there's 145,000 cases filed per year, and we're really looking at our estimates of maybe two to three cases per prosecutor. So uh, the, the system is more than capable of accommodating this type of caseload. Thank you. Justice Alito? Uh, this whole quest for watershed rules is rather strange. Uh, We keep saying there were some in the past that were discovered, uh, but it's not clear that there are any new new ones that haven't yet been discovered. But, you know, maybe, just maybe, there might be a watershed rule out there that hasn't been discovered. I mean, it sort of reminds me of something you see on some TV shows about the, uh, the quest for an animal that was thought to have become extinct, like the Tasmanian tiger, which was thought to have died out in a zoo in 1936. But every once in a while, deep in the forests of Tasmania, somebody sees a footprint in the mud or a howl in the night or some fleeting thing running by and they say, aha, there still is one that exists. So, I mean, all that is a a wind-up to getting back to the question that Justice Thomas asked. Why should we decide whether this Teague exception applies to a habeas petition brought by a state prisoner without first deciding whether it's barred by EDPA. Well, the retroactivity um, issue, as, as I said earlier, um, new rules made retroactive by the United States Supreme Court um, can be litigated by another portion of ADEPA. Secondly, I do believe that w- there is a legit, legitimate disagreement as to whether or not this case was actually decided on the merits in state post-conviction. My recollection of what we had happened on the record below is that we were um, summarily dismissed for no legal or, or, or factual basis. Um, so I, I don't believe the, the merits were fully addressed. Another oddity about applying the, the watershed rule inquiry in this particular case is that the, the test for a watershed rule depends pretty heavily on Justice Harlan's decision, his opinion in the Mackey case, which where he relied on exactly the rationale, the concept of ordered liberty, Palco versus Connecticut rationale, that the lead opinion in Ramos excoriated. So is, is, would it be consistent to apply it here? Well, I, I do think this is a, a watershed rule. Um, there are so many parallels between this case and Gideon. 
both recognized fundamental bedrock principles and both had to deal with cases that were inconsistent with those principles and restore um, the, the, the fundamental rights at issue. For Gideon, it was the right to appoint a counsel, and here it's the unanimous jury requirement. Well, isn't part of the watershed rule inquiry whether it's consistent with ordered liberty? Well, it, it is, and I don't know how we can say that a yeah, non-unanimous didn't jury just, is... Didn't Justice Gorsuch's opinion uh, uh, repudiate that, ridicule that approach? Well, I, I read Justice Gorsuch's opinion as um, not finding precedental force with Apodaca. Yeah, and Justice Powell's opinion in Apodaca was based on what? Well, Justice Powell um, thought that the Sixth Amendment wasn't fully incorporated to the states, and we know that to be wrong. And he thought it wasn't incorporated for what reason? Um, he didn't believe that the uh, Sixth Amendment was, was fully incorporated through the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. All right, thank you. Justice Sotomayor? Counsel, can you explain that 1600 uh, number. Is that all prisoners that are in jail currently, whether it's uh, a year old or not, or post uh, past their EPA time? Is that the total prison population? That th those. When you mean by prison population, if you mean that, are those the people that are in jail? Yes, Justice Sotomayor. All right. And so your statistic is based. You're saying some of them may not be able to prove that they were convicted by a, a non-unanimous verdict. Is that correct? Th that's correct. Some of, that 60, some of those 1,600 may not be able to do that, Your Honor. Why are you guessing 1,000? Um, based on uh, Amiki's efforts to pull the court records on those 1,600 people, um, they haven't been able to establish that yet. But even for purposes of just assuming that all 1,600 could prove it, it is still a burden on the petitioner to show that they had a non-unanimous jury. And, and, and there are many instances where we may find that lawyers didn't simply ask for the polling. Um, we, that would just be on a case-by-case -case basis. All right. Thank you, counsel. Justice you. Kagan? Uh, Mr. Belanger, um, as you know, I thought that Apodaca was a precedent, so you would have a very steep climb to get me to think that Ramos was anything other than a new rule. So I want to focus on the watershed inquiry. And in that inquiry, we've talked a lot about uh, accuracy. And uh, I think somebody uh, previously asked you about your empirical evidence. And I'll just give you sort of my sense that the empirics here are sparse, maybe surprisingly sparse, as to um, how this uh, uh, unanimity requirement works with respect to what I take to be the ordinary meaning of accuracy, which is simply a reduction in um, the error rate in trials. And, and so, too, it seems like one's tuition um, is not necessarily in your corner, that it might be that um, uh, the unanimity rule allows more guilty people to go free than it, um, than it stops innocent people from uh, being convicted, or at least it's just not certain. So I, I guess what I'd, I'd like to ask you is whether your, uh, well, I mean, number one, do you just contest all of everything that I just said? But number two, um, are, are you talking about accuracy in some different sense? Your first sentence uh, to us was, a verdict by a non-unanimous jury is no verdict at all. Um, and then uh, you talked about a verdict can be inaccurate and unfair even though it leads to the right decision. And I guess what I'm asking is, are you talking about, and do you think in our cases we've been talking about, accuracy in some different sense than uh, simply um, the reduction of errors in whatever direction? Um, I, I do not think that accuracy needs to necessarily be statistics-driven. I've just provided the statistics that were available for illustrative purposes. Um, a verdict by 11 is no verdict at all is an accurate statement the way the, the, way the framers intended the Sixth Amendment jury trial right to be. 
Um, I go back again to Gideon, which this court has recognized as the exemplar for the watershed rule. If the figures in that Notre Dame article were accurate, we're talking about three times as many more people as we have affected in Louisiana. And we're also talking about half of that prison population, where here we may be talking about 5%. Um, I, I do believe it is a, a systemic approach to say whether or not a trial that deprives someone of his liberty with not a unanimous verdict is fair. And could I ask you about your argument, which hasn't come up so far today, but um, featured prominently in your briefs, about the racial aspect of, uh, of, of this rule, picking up on um, Justice Gorsuch's opinion and Justice Kavanaugh's opinion about how this rule started as a, a, a the non-unanimity rule started as a racially discriminatory one. How does that play into the Teague analysis, and how can it play uh, given that we've held Batson non-retroactive? Well, I think this is a case that is different than Batson. Um, a, a Batson case is something where you're looking at the particular actions of an individual prosecutor in an individual case. And Batson requires speculation. We don't know if there would have been a unanimous verdict or not with a Batson-compliant jury. Here we know, we can, we can show that this was not a unanimous verdict. We had at least one juror and sometimes two jurors vote not guilty. And in the types of cases that we'll be talking about moving forward, the burden will be on the petitioner to show I actually have a non-unanimous jury. And, and so it is measurable, whereas Batson was not. I do think that the racial origins of the uh, the, the non-unanimous jury is something to consider. It shows that this type of system was set up for the purpose of not being accurate, for the purpose of not being fair. And even though the state has tried to cleanse itself, it still has a negative yeah. racially disproportionate impact today. Justice Gorsuch? Good morning, counsel. Um, I'd like to start with your first argument, uh, that Ramos did not announce a new rule. Um, I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic to that point of view. I believe the court had for well over 100 years spoken about the unanimity requirement, as you know. But only a plurality agreed with me on that. And, and, and uh, uh, there were a couple of joiners uh, who thought that Apodaca was a precedent of the court. The single justice speaking for himself, defying existing precedent, was nonetheless itself a precedent that we had to abide. And, of course, the dissenters took that point of view. Um, uh, how, how, how can we get to where you want us to go in that light? Do we account for the dissenter's position? Should we discount the dissenter's position? Even if we do discount that, what about the fact that the, the majority itself had different views? Um, I would have two responses. First, um, I believe the all's opinion in, in Ramos did set up two paths for the court to decide retroactivity. Secondly, um, I don't, while the, I respect the dissenter's viewpoint and realize that may be how they feel today, I do not necessarily count the votes in dissent to say explicitly we've overruled Ramos. Oh, okay. uh, Papadaka, rather, I apologize. Uh, so yeah, I'm just, just flesh that out for me a little bit more as to how you see this as not a rule, not a new rule. Um, uh, you know, certainly, Justice Ginsburg and, and, and uh, Justice Breyer and I thought that's correct, but some of the other joiners, even on the majority, did not. What about them, if you, if you have us discount the dissent? Yeah, so, you know, the, the Sixth Amendment has always required unanimity. And then going back to the Malloy versus Hogan decision, we have said that we do not um, have a watered-down Bill of Rights. So the, the two lines of precedent there... Sixth Amendment requires unanimity, and that the Sixth Amendment is fully incorporated to the states leads to one logical conclusion, and that is that Louisiana had to apply a unanimous jury scheme. And, and, and you know, Justice Powell's decision is just um, a, a unique opinion. It is one that requires us, if we, if we are to follow it, to go... Uh, to take a uh, what is considered a, a fundamental bill of right and marry it up to something that was foreclosed as um, at the time the opinion was given 
And I just don't think that is something you'll ever see ever again. Um, I think if we were to sit down people to explain that these are the two lines of precedent, Louisiana has a 10-2 system, do you think that would hold water? I think people would say no if they did not know about the Apodaca decision. I surely hope you're right. Um, with respect to the watershed route, your alternative route, um, I, you, you've gotten different variations of the question, but uh, I, I guess the way I'd, I'd put it is uh, Teague holds out this promise that there's going to be some watershed rule, and, and hands of Gideon is an example, which predates Teague, of course. But then ever since, we haven't, we haven't found a single one. Uh, is this a false promise? If it is, should we just admit it's a false promise? If it isn't a false promise, then what counts? What principle counts? If the Stefano doesn't count, Ring doesn't count, Batson doesn't count, Crawford doesn't count, are we just who are we kidding? And what should we do about it? Your, Your Honor, I, I, I couldn't frame it better. Um, this for Teague to mean anything, there has to be something that counts, and that's why I think that. Ramos is more analogous to Gideon than any of these other cases that we have decided in the past. Both decisions restored our understanding of fundamental bedrock principles. Both of these decisions took away a, a, a case that deviated from those prior precedents. And because you'll never see an opinion like Apodaca again, we can all rest assured that this is not going to open any type of floodgate. This has to be a watershed rule if you find that Apodaca was explicitly overruled by Ramos. Thank you, Counsel. Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice, and good morning, uh, Counsel. Uh, I had been concerned uh, that your approach would require us to chart a new path on retroactivity. As Justice Thomas and Justice Alito pointed out, uh, we have a long line of cases, and you were just discussing with Justice Gorsuch, post-Teague cases such as Wharton uh, about the Crawford rule and, and many others where we have declined to apply a new uh, rule retroactively on collateral. Uh, I'm also, though, concerned uh, about the, some of the pre-Teague cases, which I think are on point here. The Chief Justice brought up to Stefano, uh, you've, you've equated – uh, Ramos to Gideon, the dissenters and De Stefano uh, equated the jury trial right itself to Gideon, Justice Douglas and Justice Black uh, in their dissent. Um, and I just want to give you an opportunity, the, the, the jury trial right not applying retroactively, uh, but the uh, unanimous jury right applying retroactively on collateral review seems like um, an asymmetry. Sure. Um, two, two responses to that. First of all, I think we have to uh, remember that Di Stefano was decided by a different standard of retroactivity than Teague. And the three factors in existence at that time, two of them were heavily relate, uh, weighted towards the state's reliance -ish interest. Or that was law, uh, reliance by law enforcement and the overall effect on the administration of justice with a retroactive application. Those two enumerated factors are rem removed from Teague analysis. We just have to focus on fairness and accuracy. Um, and, and, and the second point is that um, that issue um, would, would, would have required the court to say that a judge-made decision is somehow um, so inconsistent in accuracy and fairness than with a, a jury decision. And, and that has not been the position of this court, so th it is a bit different. Okay. On the um, Batson angle, uh, as you know, in Ramos, I thought the uh, Batson precedent was an important, uh, uh, important one in thinking about how the non-unanimous jury actually operated in practice. Uh, and I think Batson is uh, a landmark opinion and one of the m more important opinions uh, in this court's uh, history in terms of ensuring that trials occur without racial discrimination. Uh, yet, in Allen v. Hardy, we did not apply 
uh, Batson retroactively. I know Justice Kagan referenced this with you, and that's, I guess, another asymmetry I'm concerned about here uh, in, in this case. And your distinction of, of Alan V. Hardy would be? Well, it, I'm, I'm sorry. My, my distinction, Your Honor, would be that Allen versus Hardy um, was also using the pre-teak standards that um, heavily uh, relied upon the reliance factors of the state. And secondly, with again, with Batson challenges, they're hard to measure. You, you just do not know if a Batson-compliant jury would or would not have found guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, I think Whereas that's, here, I can measure it. Yeah, that's. I, I think that's a fair point. Uh, Last thing I wanted to mention, you've uh, several times cited Brown versus Louisiana, and I agree with you, the plurality there is supportive of you, but the uh, opinion that, that was decisive was the concurring opinion of Justice Powell and Justice Stevens, and they would have applied Birch retroactively only on direct to cases pending on direct, not on collateral. Uh, any response to that? Uh, yes, um you know, with the, the Teague analysis now, we do really make that distinction between direct and collateral review. Um, but Brown was illustrative of the fact that the standard at that time applied the same standards on direct and on collateral review. Um, I, I think the, the premise that unanimity was required and under a standard of review applicable at the time, it was. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Justice Barrett? Mr. Belanger, I want to press you a little bit more on Justice Kagan's questions to you about what accuracy means, because when I heard your answers to Justice Kagan, it was hard for me to distinguish between your view of the accuracy prong and your view of the bedrock procedural element prong, the uh, fairness of the proceeding, because you kept saying, well, it's possible for a um, non-unanimous jury verdict to have reached the right result, i.e. maybe convicting someone who actually, in fact, had committed the crime while still being unfair. Can you can you help me um, understand a, a little bit more how your two prongs are distinct, what accuracy means? Yeah, well, we, the, the accuracy component is we're looking to see whether or not the, the, the system of how the trial took place was fair. And in, in Gideon versus Wainwright, we have said that all of these cases where people were not represented by counsel was not fair. But I can't tell you today how many of those people would have been exonerated. Well, but well right. is- you may not be able to identify a specific number, but I mean, I think what Gideon was saying is that there is a significant chance that someone may have been um, convicted when he otherwise would not have been or when it was um, it reached the wrong results. I-, I guess I don't understand you know, you've got statistics saying that in Louisiana, as many unanimous verdict defendants have been exonerated or even more than those who've been convicted by non-unanimous juries, or that Oregon has a lower rate per capita of exonerations than those states that do have the unanimous right. So so what does it mean? Are we trying to ask whether juries wrongfully convicted someone because the majority saw the case in the wrong way and the, and the one dissenter in the jury or the two dissenters in the jury were right? Can you just, I'm just having trouble understanding what we're measuring. Well, th- this type of verdict would not be a verdict anywhere else but Oregon. Um, so fundamentally, at its premise, it is not a conviction. Um, the um, w- Trying to look at, at fairness in, in, in dealing with how this can uh, how this jury verdict can can stand. I, I have to go back to why it was created in the first place. This jury scheme was created so it would not be accurate, so it could disproportionately impact a segment of the population. And it is true that it still has those negative effects even today. Well, in cases like Crawford or, or even Batson, you pointed out that, you know, it you called it speculative in Batson as to whether a juror that had been struck would have voted differently, but here we know that someone would have voted differently. I mean, Batson is an egregious example of racial contamination um, and discrimination in a jury that may well have affected the verdict. Um, it seems to me that it would be speculation here, too, to think that the case would have come out differently with the unanimous jury. Well, I don't think we have to speculate here. In our particular case, I have one juror 
on, on every count that voted not guilty, and I have another juror on some counts that voted not guilty. Um, people that want to raise Ramos retroactively will have to come into court and show that they had a non-unanimous jury. And so there is no speculation as to whether or not we have a proper unanimous verdict in these types of cases. Okay, thank you, counsel. Uh, counsel, a minute to wrap up. Ramos is retroactive in either of two ways. For members of this court who viewed Apodaca as an anomaly that did not alter prevailing constitutional standards, Ramos was largely dictated by precedent and set out an old rule. For members of this court who viewed Ramos as announcing a new rule, it is a watershed rule of criminal procedure akin to Gideon. Jury unanimity predates the founding and ranks amongst our most indispensable rights. It is significantly improves the accuracy and fairness because a verdict taken from 11 is no verdict at all. The state has no legitimate interest in avoiding retroactivity. Louisiana's non-unanimous jury scheme was thoroughly racist and discriminatory in its origin. As members of this court said in Ramos, we should not perpetuate something we all know to be wrong only because we fear the consequences of being right. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, General Murrell? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Louisiana adopted its 10-2 jury verdict rule in 1974 after a new constitutional convention where delegates expressly relied on Apodaca v. Oregon and Johnson v. Louisiana when revising its criminal procedures. Petitioner minimizes Louisiana and Oregon's reliance interests and dismisses Puerto Rico's entirely, but there can be no doubt that declaring the Ramos rule retroactive unsettles thousands of cases that involved terrible crimes in all three jurisdictions. Requiring new trials in long final criminal cases would be impossible in some and particularly unfair to the victims of these crimes. Ramos is unquestionably a new rule. This court has held on numerous occasions that a discarded precedent is the clearest sign of a new rule. Six justices in Ramos agreed that Apodaca was a binding precedent and virtually every jurist, state and federal, addressing the issue before Ramos viewed it that way as well for almost 50 years. Petitioner concedes that Ramos announced a procedural rule, so Ramos only applies retroactively if it's a watershed rule. While undoubtedly important, Ramos isn't a watershed rule. A supermajority verdict does not render a trial fundamentally unfair, nor does it seriously undermine factual accuracy of the verdict. In some cases, unanimity might improve accuracy, but in others, it might diminish it. Here, Edwards confessed to rape and armed robbery and was identified by one of his victims. Because Ramos was decided long after Edwards' conviction became final, the Teague retroactivity bar should prevent him and others like him from benefiting from Ramos' holding. This court should affirm the Fifth Circuit's denial of a certificate of appealability. Uh, General, you talk about um, Ramos as overruling uh, Apodaca, um, but it's questionable exactly what it overruled. It, it, I think it's more accurate to say it overruled uh, the decision uh, rather than the uh, opinion, because it's not really clear uh, what the what the opinion was. Uh, so that doesn't that discount uh, the conclusion that it's a, a new decision if, if it's it's not the same as overruling a, a typical uh, precedent? No, Mr. Chief Justice. I think that, for, so for one thing, I think that the question is what, how lower courts would have perceived it when they were applying the rule at the time. And this court, even in Ramos, recognized that the court itself has been studiously ambiguous and even inconsistent about what Apodaca might mean. But there's no question that its result was binding. I think its result was always binding on lower courts, and this court has also very carefully guarded its right to overrule its own precedent, even where it was the result that was binding, if not the reasoning. Your friend tells us that um, uh, over uh, uh, making Ramos retro retroactive is not going to have a very significant impact uh, on the criminal justice system in uh, Louisiana. Uh, is, do you agree with his uh, uh, math, I guess, that it's going to be simply two or three additional cases per prosecutor in the state? 
So we absolutely disagree with that math, and I, I think that it is it, it's certainly not fair to suggest that we can just distribute all serious felony to that nearly by their own number, 1,600 or more new appeals um, and new trials for um, people that might be retroactively impacted by this. You can't just hand out cases to anybody who happens to be an assistant district attorney. I mean, some of those people actually enforce laws in city court and or do, you know, they collect money for, they do civil cases. I mean, it's not fair to spread Uh, them out that way. Justice Thomas? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, Counsel, uh, there's been some discussion about what we thought on this court about Apodaca and the decision, uh, et cetera. And there has been some confusion, but in the lower courts, do you know of any court that did not think that Apodaca uh, permitted or not perhaps uh, allowed the uh, use of non-unanimous juries? Or did not, or, or actually did not think that Apodaca held that unanimous juries were permissible. Non-unanimous juries were permissible. No, Justice Thomas, not a single one. State and federal judges, to 100 percent of them, believed that it was settled precedent. And in fact, the petitioner, even in his habeas petition, acknowledged that it was settled petition as as he did at the time that he brought this issue up in front of the commissioner at the state trial level. So what role should that play in our analysis of whether or not this is a new rule? Well, I mean, I think it plays a a significant role because both under Teague and under EDPA, the, the court asks what was clearly established law at the time that the state adjudicated the claim. And I would also disagree with my friend's position that it, the state, that he claims that this wasn't adjudicated on the merits. It clearly was raised on and adjudicated on the merits uh, by the commissioner and the state district court in post-conviction relief. Uh, One quick question. Uh, What's your view of what the term accuracy means? Does it mean scientifically accurate both in acquittal and convictions, or is it loading uh, or a thumb on the scale one way or the other to prevent inaccurate convictions? Well, I think this court has, has treated the accuracy question as a question of factual accuracy. Um, but, and, and under Teague, the, the analysis asks an even, even harder question, I think. It's not enough to say that it's aimed at improving the accuracy or that it's directed toward enhancing reliability or accuracy in some way. The question is whether the new rule remedied an impermissibly large risk of an inaccurate conviction, and I don't think you can say that about a, a supermajority verdict rule. Thank you. Justice Breyer? I have two questions. The first is, do you know uh, any numbers about new trials that would be required in Puerto Rico or Oregon as well as yours? And the reason I think that's important is I, I have always seen Teague as a kind of compromise here that because of the 14th Amendment applying to the states, our court, this court, the Supreme Court, was insisting upon uh, somewhat fairer constitutional procedures, but they didn't want to let everyone out of prison, so they compromised. Now, if that's so, I'd like to know the total impact. Do you know anything about California, uh, about Puerto Rico and uh, Oregon, or do you know where I could find it? Just- Justice Breyer, I don't have exact numbers. Puerto Rico and Oregon both filed amicus briefs emphasizing the, their their belief that this would have an, a, a very significant um, impact in their states. And Oregon cites to two cases that are currently challenging plea agreements. And, and we have um, we, do, we also have concerns about that. We know that um, that the issue in, in our state has been raised to challenge a plea agreement as well. So it doesn't just affect those that were non-unanimous jury verdicts. It also has been raised as a, um, a claim for a plea, uh, to undermine and attack plea agreements. And those are even larger in number. But just in our state, we, we would take the Promise of Justice Initiative's numbers at face value and think 1,600 is an awfully lot of new trials. Well, and also my totally separate question is, what do you do about Brown versus Louisiana? 
it says that it's retroactive because you have a six man, a six person jury has to be uh, unanimous. It can't be five to one. So if a six person person uh, jury can't be five to one, a twelve person can't be ten to two. And if the first was fundamental, why isn't the second? Well, I think Brown is is um, is distinguishable in a couple of ways, but I when I think to the 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 kind of question of accuracy, I think that Brown specifically related to the number of jurors, and it held that it was retroactively but retroactive in part um, because I think it found that five was simply not enough, and it was looking at. Ballou and Birch collectively and and finding that even where you had a six man jury, you ultimately only had a five person verdict. And in Ballou, the court had said five wasn't enough to have a, have a significant for the jury to actually do its job. Thank you, counsel. Uh, Justice Alito. Uh, Gideon versus Wainwright, which recognized the. Sixth Amendment right to appointed counsel if the defendant is indigent was a watershed rule, wasn't it? Well, this court has always pointed to Gideon as the, the, the one example that would be considered a watershed rule, so yes. But that was not based on the original meaning or understanding of the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. Isn't that right? That's right. I, I think it, 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 the, the discussions in all of the court's cases about Gideon and why it was watershed po- points to the primacy and centrality of the rule throughout the process of a criminal prosecution from start to, to finish. Well, maybe that's your answer to the next question I was going to ask. But if if the Gideon rule, which was not the original meaning of the Sixth Amendment is a watershed rule. How could we find that a the, the unanimity rule, which the court held in Ramos, was dictated by the original meaning of the Sixth Amendment, does not rise to the level of a watershed a watershed rule? Well, Justice Alito, I don't think that the historical roots of the rule is what determines whether or not it is a watershed rule. I mean, that's that's certainly not how the court examined it in Schreiro v. Summerlin. Um, I, I, I think the court has actually just looked at two questions, and and that is whether it alters the court's understanding of a bedrock procedural element that is essential to fairness of a proceeding. And it, it can't be met, the standard can't be met simply by showing the rule is based on a red bedrock right. And I would submit that Ramos is a rule that may be built on other bedrock rules, but it didn't establish a bedrock rule. Well, those who uh, insisted on including the Bill of Rights as a condition for ratifying the Constitution certainly thought that the rules protected by the Bill of Rights were bedrock rules, or if they thought of this rather strange term, watershed rules. So isn't there something rather odd about our saying, well, that's what they thought, but we know better now, and some of the rules that they thought were bedrock rules really are not so bedrock or watershed. But there are some others, like the Gideon rule, which we now think are more important. So those would be retroactive on collateral review. Well, I, I think, Justice Alito, that that's changing the nature of the Teague analysis. Um, Teague, Teague doesn't focus, and none of this court's precedents have, in, in conducting the Teague retroactivity analysis, have focused necessarily on the historical roots of the rule in deciding whether it was or should be held retroactive under Teague. And, and, EDPA asks an even more limited question. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Justice Sotomayor? Counsel, could you tell me, and I'm going to ask the Solicitor General the same question, um, if this is not watershed, give me what you think might be. And it harkens back to the questions of some of my colleagues earlier of the other side, which is, since Teague, we haven't found anything watershed. Um, 
are we claiming an exception that is we're never going to utilize? No, Justice Kagan, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's fair this to leave open the this possibility. Is, counsel, this is oh, I'm sorry. But why don't you yeah, start again? You say no, sorry, but give me, hypothe- give me hypotheticals of what you think might qualify. Uh, okay. I mean, I think, Justice Sotomayor, that, that I would look potentially back at the, the purpose of the scope of the writ. I mean, for, for one thing, I think you're applying, you're, you are in the context of habeas corpus, so I think that's important. And, and I don't, you know, this court has never applied anything as watershed other than Gideon, but I think when you talk about the, the original context of habeas corpus, the court has pointed to things like a trial that was tainted by mob violence or... Um, or, you know, something of that nature. I mean, that, that is one potential answer, I think, to that question. How about a trial that was held by a special master without consent? Well, I think a trial held by a special master without consent potentially goes to jurisdiction. I mean, the, the court has also addressed the scope of the writ and the the historical scope of the writ in the context of whether a court had actual jurisdiction to entertain the case. And if it wasn't a court of competent jurisdiction where a special master without consent would arguably not be a court of competent jurisdiction. All right. Um, I am a little troubled by the empirical studies, but for a different reason than you are. You haven't put anything to the contrary. You really haven't put any evidence that the that there aren't a significant number of people who are, have been wrongfully convicted because of the lack of unanimity. You say there some people benefited and some people didn't, but what does it matter? Meaning if some people didn't benefit from the rule and may have been not guilty doesn't that answer the watershed question on its own? No, I don't, I don't think that it does, because I think the focus of the question, the question focuses on whether it is a procedural element that is essential to the proceeding and so seriously undermines the, 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 the process that we can't have any confidence in, in, in the verdict at all. I, I think that's what the question is. And that Thank simply you. cannot be Thank said. You. About Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Justice Kagan? Uh, General, in In Ray Winship, this court held that a reasonable doubt standard was, uh, had to be used by any criminal jury. Uh, and that was before Teague, but if you, but if Teague had applied, do you think that that would have been held to be a uh, retroactive rule? I mean, it's, it's. I think it's possible. I mean, I, you know, the court has not declared Cage to be retroactive. I, I don't. I, I think just, that the, to, you know, just what I asked. I mean, it's possible. Yes or no. It, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I think that the beyond a reasonable doubt standard goes to the, the, the proof that's put on throughout the course of the trial. So possibly, I'm going to tell yeah. you, General, that I think you're having trouble with the question. It's hard to say because uh, it, it, two things are true. We cannot imagine that rule being viewed as anything less than fundamental to our entire system. That's mm-hmm. number one. But number two... If you're only talking about accuracy as like a reduction of error rate across the board, I mean, we wouldn't have that rule. We would have a preponderance standard. So, I mean, that's what makes it hard. And and I guess I think it's inconceivable that it wouldn't be held to be retroactive. Well, Justice Kagan, I think the court did examine that the, the, the context of the beyond a reasonable doubt standard in the context of a non-unanimity rule in Johnson, and, and it, it really did look at the question of each individual juror carrying, and, and I don't think we can assume that 11, 10 or 11 jurors 
are not doing their duty and following their jury instructions. And that was, I think, part of the premise of Johnson. When you look at a non-unanimity rule, you're looking at each individual juror's whether each individual juror would carry their carry their burden and and take their instruction seriously, and the court found there's no reason to assume they won't. Thank you, Justice Gorsuch. Good morning, counsel. Um, as I heard you in response to the Chief Justice, you said you absolutely did dispute uh, the estimates of about 1,600 cases. Um, yeah, but I haven't actually seen or heard anything where you do dispute that that is the appropriate number. Am I missing Just, something? Justice Gorsuch, we don't dispute the 1,600 number. In, I mean, we have no basis to dispute it. We, but I would, what we disputed was the premise that you could simply grant new trials and distribute all of those cases across the board to any prosecutor who happens to be an assistant district attorney. I understand That's that, what we but, but the number, the universe is agreed, it seems, then. We have no, we have no reason to dispute that number. The, the amici who filed that has been in the system trying to generate data about how many convictions there might be, but and, it is all based what, on records. What relevance does this have anyway? Uh, as I understand your argument is, okay, it's 1,600, but it's really difficult. Um, wouldn't we expect it to be difficult if, in fact, there were a watershed rule, um, if this really were a significant change uh, and an important one, wouldn't we expect there to be some burden for the state? And, and where does Teague tell us that that matters? Well, I think every retroactivity question assumes or, or takes into account that there will be some burden. And I think that it's built into the Teague analysis in, in terms of our reliance interests. I and mean, that was the pre-Teague link letter t- balancing test expressly you'd, took you'd, that you'd, into you'd account. agree with that, me, though. I think you'd agree that if it is watershed, it's retroactive regardless of the burdens on the state. And, in fact, we'd expect some burdens on the state in such a case, Right. I think the Teague, the Teague, if it's watershed, Teague, just, that is the question in the Teague analysis is whether it's retroactive. I'm not sure it answers the question of whether it's still precluded under EDPA. I understand that, counsel. I'm not asking about EDPA. You mm-hmm. told me not to even think about EDPA in your brief. <laughs> Fine. Uh, so I'm talking about under Teague. Once we answer the Teague question that it's watershed, it doesn't matter how many cases there are. In fact, if it really were watershed, we'd expect there to be a considerable number, right? Yes. I mean, I think Teague is calibrated to account for reliance interests. That's the presumption against retroactivity. Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, Thank you, Chief Justice, and good morning, uh, General Merrill. Uh, In uh, Ramos, uh, Justice Gorsuch's opinion, uh, and mine as well, talked about the history of non-unanimous juries, uh, the linkage uh, to uh, racist origins. Uh, I know your point about the 1974 uh, adoption, uh, but I also looked at the, how it was linked to the history of race-based peremptory strikes in Batson and how those two things had come from a, from a similar place, a similar uh, unfortunate place in our history, in the court, in the uh, country's history. And in this case, uh, you know, there's a black defendant. Uh, the state uses its peremptory strikes to strike all but one black juror, uses four of its six peremptories against uh, black uh, veneer persons, uh, strikes five blacks for cause uh, because several of them, in part for several of them, uh, had a family history of incarceration. Uh, and you're left with one black juror with a black defendant. And then you get a 11-to-1 verdict on the uh, armed robbery count, the two kidnapping counts, one of the armed robbery counts, two kidnapping counts, and the rape count. Uh, and the one... Uh, Juror uh, is the black uh, black woman, the black juror. Uh, this case seems like a classic example of what we were concerned about with the combination of 
peremptory challenges being used on the basis of race, uh, maybe not to strike every juror, uh, but to strike all but one, and then the non-unanimous jury system uh, complementing the, the uh, peremptory challenges. I know there wasn't a Batson, successful Batson challenge in this case, but uh, the facts of this case certainly uh, seem troubling on how it all played out. Just give you an opportunity to react to that if you want. Justice Kavanaugh, I mean, the, the Batson claim was rejected because there was absolutely no basis for Batson challenges in this case. And, and I mean, you can, you can read the voir dire in the record and see that there were non-race based, there were neutral reasons for striking the jurors that were struck. And in some of these cases, um, Sydney, Sydney Eatman is one example. There was a white male juror and a black male juror struck at the exact same time for the exact same reason. Thank you, Counsel. So, Justice Barrett? General Merle, I'd like to ask you about 2254D. So Justices Thomas and Gorsuch asked Mr. Belanger whether 2254D erected an independent bar, you know, regardless of what we say about Teague. We have an amicus brief saying that 24, 2255D1 supersedes Teague, so there are no exceptions. There is no watershed exception, and that's because 2254D1 um, precludes a federal court from granting relief um, if the claim resulted, if the state court adjudication resulted in a decision that was contrary to or involved an unreasonable application of, sorry, permits granting relief only in that circumstance. And 2254 D1 makes no mention of watershed rules, perhaps reflecting Justice Alito's view that, you know, these are Tasmanian tigers and there are none left. And so under 2254 D1, federal courts ought not be engaging in the Teague exception analysis. Do you have a position on that? Yes, yes, Justice Barrett. Our position is that Edwards can't surmount EDSA's relitigation bar and that it asks a very narrow question, and it's a backward-looking question about what was clearly established law at the time the state adjudicated the claim, and that was Apodaca. So I think, you know, we do have a – that is our position on it. We, we answered the question the court posed with regard to Teague, and the court has treated Teague as a separate threshold inquiry. Um, but, but you think we're wrong to do that. Way. So you think we're wrong to do that, however. You think that 2254-D1 does supersede Teague? So that there should not no, be an independent I Teague think- inquiry? That, that, I don't think that's been entirely briefed. We simply argued in our, our brief that he is precluded under both. So you don't have a position on the amicus brief? I, I, I think we would join the United States in saying that, that, that might need to be litigated further if you got to that point. But I mean, our position is that, that he is precluded under both. That even if it was a watershed, we're really still precluded under that statute. So, I mean, I, I guess, in, we do believe Thank that you. it was overridden. Thank um, you. A minute to wrap up, General. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. While the Ramos decision is no doubt an important one, Ramos' rule incorporating the unanimity rule against the states isn't a watershed rule. Permitting a supermajority rule was not a fundamentally unfair procedure, nor does the absence of unanimity seriously undermine the accuracy of the verdict. This court should affirm the Fifth Circuit denial of COA. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Michel? Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. The rule announced by this Court in Ramos applies prospectively and to convictions on direct appeal, but it does not apply to final convictions on federal collateral review. That result follows from a straightforward application of Teague. The Ramos rule is new because whatever disputes might exist about the precedential weight of Apodaca in this Court, it was at least reasonable for lower courts to rely on it when petitioner's conviction became final in 2011. And the rule is not watershed because it is not essential to accuracy or a fair trial. After all, as the Chief Justice suggested at the outset of the argument, the right to a jury trial itself is not watershed, so subsidiary rights like that of a unanimous jury cannot be either. That result also reflects the purposes of federal collateral review. As Teague emphasized, habeas is not a substitute for direct appeal, 
When a criminal judgment obtained under the law at the time becomes final, it should stay final outside the very no, narrow exceptions that are not satisfied here. Uh, counsel, I'm not sure that your um, reliance on De Stefano uh, is really right. Uh, it, isn't the right to a unanimous jury more important as a matter of factual accuracy uh, than the right to a jury uh, itself? I mean, you would expect a judge uh, to be at least as accurate uh, and presumably even more uh, uh, than uh, uh, a jury. So I'm not sure that the fact that De Stefano is not retroactive really uh, – uh, makes the case that this right uh, shouldn't be? Well, Mr. Chief Justice, a couple of responses. I think the court in Summerlin, for example, said that it's, it's just hard to tell whether a judge or a jury is going to be more accurate, and I think that alone is enough uh, to, to show that petitioner can't meet the high standard here. But I take your point, even if you don't think DiStefano uh, gets you all the way, the court has repeatedly uh, declined to find Watershed other subsidiary jury rights, uh, including in Teague itself, with both, which both reaffirmed the court's decision in Allen versus Hardy that Batson is not uh, retroactive on collateral review and also rejected the fair cross-section requirement. Uh, so I think all of those subsidiary jury rights, including the unanimity right at issue here, uh, simply don't meet the watershed test. Uh, counsel, very briefly, does the federal government have any light to shed on the statistics that we've been talking about? Uh, you, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, the the one we know the best is the federal uh, interest here. As we mentioned in our brief, there is a, a sort of ripple effect from the vacatur of these convictions on uh, federal recidivist sentences. Uh, you know, we think the number is somewhere around a couple of hundred. It's hard to pin down the, the exact number, but there would be an impact on the federal system. Justice Thomas? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, counsel, would you just briefly um, discuss the term accuracy and what you think it means in this context? Yes, Justice Thomas. I, I think the court um, uh, has not always uh, spoken with one voice on that, but there are certainly uh, a number of opinions in which accuracy, I think, can, is understood just to mean factual accuracy. The court in Wharton, for example, when discussing Crawford, uh, made the point that confrontation could sometimes actually make uh, make a, a trial less accurate. Uh, and the court in Butler versus McKellar, when discussing the Fourth Amendment right at issue there, made the same point. Uh, so I think the court has focused on factual accuracy, uh, but even if you were to adopt a more uh, generous understanding of it and look to sort of the risk of wrongful convictions, uh, I still think the right here doesn't uh, doesn't come close, uh, especially under this court's decision in Johnson versus Louisiana, which expressly held that a non-unanimous jury verdict uh, does not uh, impugn the fairness or accuracy of the conviction. Uh, and what role do you think that the uh, sordid uh, roots of the uh, non-unanimous jury rule in Louisiana should play in our analysis? Well, I think uh, the court, uh, at least some members of the court, took that into account uh, in the decision last time, uh, the decision at Ramos. But I think as, as both Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh's opinions recognize, uh, that there's simply a separate question here. I think Justice Gorsuch said you shouldn't double count the reliance interest between stare decisis and retroactivity. And Justice Kavanaugh, of course, while uh, recognizing those racial issues, uh, uh, seemed to suggest that this right shouldn't apply retroactively. Uh, so I I think it, it can't be dispositive here. So in your, just briefly, where do you think this, uh, the authority of this court to apply rules retroactively comes from? So I think uh, th this court has said in Danforth, for example, that, that Teague ultimately reflects uh, an interpretation of the habeas statute. I think the, the court, you know, has, has over centuries exercised the right to control the finality of its judgments through rules of res judicata and preclusion, uh, and I think uh, there's a similar source of authority here. Justice Breyer? Well, I thought maybe it'll just be repetitive, but uh, the, we're talking about the Anglo-American system, and that's in the Seventh Amendment, jury trial, and so forth. Now, within the confines of that system, why isn't unanimity basic? And if it's basic, aren't these just words, the accuracy and so forth? And you're really trying to think of how basic is this? And then compare it to everybody who's going to be released from jail. That was the old system. 
Maybe Teague changed that a lot. I don't know. Uh, what do you think? Why isn't it basic? Well, J Justice Breyer, I suppose I could start with the, the Anglo part of the Anglo-American system. I do think it's notable that England, for example, uh, you know, continues to use non-unanimous jury verdicts. Uh, and as, as the court pointed out in Johnson versus Louisiana, you know, respected institutions in the Anglo-American system like the ABA and the ALI and respected professors uh, have all endorsed uh, non-unanimous jury verdicts on legitimate grounds, uh, uh, such as avoiding hung juries. So uh, I, I do think, although... Uh, uh, the, the court, of course, concluded in Ramos that the text and history of the Sixth Amendment require unanimity. Uh, I don't think that's the same thing as saying that uh, it, it's essential to accuracy and fairness under the inquiry the court has outlined at Teague. Okay, I see. Thank you. Justice Alito? Well, where does the authority to impose the Teague rule on the states come from? If it's an interpretation of the, of the habeas statute, then... Don't we have to deal with 2254D? If it's not an interpretation of the statute, it would have to come from a provision of a constitution such as the suspension clause. Is that where you think it comes from? But, so Justice Alito, I, I want to distinguish between the, the general retroactivity bar of Teague, which is what I, I uh, meant to refer to earlier by saying that's an interpretation of the habeas statute informed by equity and the historical scope of the writ. Separately, uh, I think your question is getting to what's the uh, authority for the exceptions to Teague. The court, uh, the majority of the court in Montgomery versus Louisiana suggested that the substantive rule exception is rooted in the Constitution. Uh, the court has not uh, reached a similar determination with respect to the watershed rule exception, I think in part because it's never been applied. Uh, but if forced to confront that, I think we would say that's, uh, that's not constitutionally required uh, and, and it's supported by, at best, uh, you know, an equitable determination similar to that that informs the retroactivity bar. Well, why should we decide this case under the Teague exception if there is a possibility that the Teague exception doesn't matter as a result of EDPA? What kind of a decision would that be? Well, to be candid, Justice Alito, we were trying to follow the court's lead uh, with the question presented here, of, uh, which refers to retroactivity. Of, of course, uh, the opinions in Ramos uh, referred repeatedly to, to Teague, uh, and I do think that uh, – with respect, this is a straightforward case under Teague. Uh, I think that's, that's plenty uh, to, to resolve it, and uh, it's a separate and independent basis from, from EDPA. It would be enough to resolve the case. Thank you. Justice Sotomayor? Counsel, um, do you think the Teague exception is an o a no set? If not, can you think of any example of a potential watershed rule that is not Gideon? And second... You dispute, I'd, I'd like to answer both, so I'm going to give you your remaining time for that. You dispute that unanimity is necessary to increase accuracy in jury ver verdicts. But I can't think of any justification other than that for the unanimity requirement that the Constitution see, that says the founders must have thought that that process enabled accuracy. So I don't know why I should second-guess them or on what basis we would second-guess them. If it's okay, Justice Sotomayor, I might start with the second question first. Uh, I think the, 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 uh, the plurality opinion in Ramos uh, importantly didn't rely on functional considerations like fairness and accuracy in, uh, in reaching its interpretation of the Sixth Amendment. It said you know, the unanimity requirement may serve purposes that evade our current notice. Uh, and I think you know, the, the most extensive discussion of that issue is found in footnote two of Justice White's opinion in Apodaca. Of course, that opinion is no longer uh, governing, but it but the history is still valid, and it suggests a number of different historical bases for the unanimity requirement, including the medieval notion that, uh, you know, one juror who disagreed would be committing perjury, uh, which would have the consequence of damnation, and the medieval notion of consent, uh, which, among other things, was manifested in the requirement that Parliament itself pass laws by unanimity. So, uh, you know, I, I do think there are some medieval origins of this uh, that don't necessarily go to, uh, to accuracy or, or fairness, as we would think of it today. 
Uh, on your first question, uh, I do want to make the point, of course, that you know the substantive rule exception to uh, to, to Teague is alive and well, and the court has found uh, substantive rules uh, recently. Uh, as to the watershed rule exception, it's true that the court has said uh, Gideon is the only one in, in recent memory. Uh, but you know, I, I think that reflects more that the things we would think of as watershed, uh, you know, simply have been recognized earlier. Justice uh, Kagan. Uh, Mr. Michelle, you told Justice Breyer that the unanimity requirement wasn't basic, but when I read the opinions on the majority side in Ramos, I think they say it absolutely is, you know, that it's basic in the exact same way that a beyond a reasonable doubt standard is basic, that it goes to uh, the inherent characteristics of what in our system a jury has to do to find a defendant guilty. I mean, Ramos says that if you haven't been convicted by a unanimous jury, you really haven't been convicted at all. And so how could it be that a rule like that does not have retroactive effect? Well, Justice Kagan, I, I, I take all your points about, uh, you know, the merits decision in, in Ramos, uh, but, but I think, uh, as Wharton, for example, explains, the, the fact that uh, a constitutional rule is compelled by the text and history of, of the Constitution itself uh, doesn't mean that it's retroactive on collateral review. There, but I'm not just talking rate. about the origins of the rule and whether it goes back to founding times. There's more in Ramos. There's, there's, there's an idea that in those founding times, it was thought, this rule was thought of as inherent in what it meant to have a fair trial by jury and, a, and an accurate trial by jury. So that whatever came out of that process, if unanimity wasn't a part of it, there wasn't a true conviction. Well, I, That's what I, Ramos says. I'm just trying to take what Ramos says seriously here which I think you want to do, too. Absolutely, uh, although I, I do think, with respect, you could say the same thing about uh, Duncan and Apprendi uh, and other cases in which, you know, the court has found that a, a determination by, the, by a jury beyond a reasonable doubt is, is required on the merits and yet uh, is not retroactive on collateral review because there's simply a different, uh, a different inquiry there. Uh, and, again, I guess I would, I would return to the court's holding in Johnson versus Louisiana that a non-unanimous jury verdict does not impugn the fairness or accuracy of the majority verdict of guilty. Uh, Thank I, I, you, I, Mr. Michel. Justice Gorsuch? Good morning, counsel. Uh, just to pick up there and, and with Justice Sotomayor's line of questioning, as I understand your argument to us today, the watershed rule exception in Teague uh, might have served a purpose at some point, um, but it doesn't any longer because we've captured all watershed rules of criminal procedure none are likely to come forward and uh and it, it is hard to see if if this doesn't qualify which the founders thought was an essential component of a jury trial right then it's pretty hard to see what might uh, emerge um that would qualify is that a fair statement of the government's position uh I, I think yes. I mean, we're not. I accept. I would qualify to say we're not saying that it's impossible uh, that that such a right could emerge. But I agree with the court's repeated statement that it's very unlikely that one will emerge at this point. Does the government have any anyone in mind that might emerge? I mean, any any possible hypothetical that you can imagine? Uh, it, there, there's nothing that uh, that we're thinking of. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would also note that, of course, when Teague made that statement, which has been repeated uh, for many decades, uh, you know, the court was well aware of the non-unanimous jury issue. Uh, and so uh, if, if the court thought that that was something that could arise in the future, it seems unlikely it would have said that, you know, no, no, uh, uh, no watershed rules are likely to arise in the future. You're giving a lot of credit to the Teague court for thinking about all these eventualities, and I appreciate that. But um, it, 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 does all this point out or maybe suggest that, that uh, post-conviction review here has been overextended and that while Teague was once an attempt to rein in uh, considerable efforts, you know, I think of Brown versus Allen, uh, to, to apply the Constitution post-conviction, that m maybe this, this whole area is, uh, the, the Teague itself is a little outmoded and that maybe we ought to just give up the ghost? Is that, is that the government's essential point of view? Uh, you know, I'm not sure I would go all the way there, but I, uh, I do think there's a lot of merit to what you're saying. Uh, I, I do think, actually, if you look back at 
uh, Justice Harlan's uh, opinions that gave rise to Teague and Judge Friendly's article that was relied on. It, it was saying something pretty similar to that, that, you know, the exceptions really have to be narrow. The substantive exception when something is not a crime and the watershed rule exception has to be similarly high, something so serious uh, that you're really not sure a crime was committed. And so I think if you keep the exceptions that narrow, Teague is, is serving a good purpose. But I agree that if they could be overread and they would, they would do real damage. Justice Kavanaugh? Uh, thank you, and good morning, Mr. Michelle. I wanted to follow up on something Justice Gorsuch was uh, asking uh, uh, the Solicitor General of Louisiana about, which is, uh, do you think uh, the number of cases that would be affected has any bearing on whether something is watershed? I think it does. I think it goes to uh, the reasons for having a high bar, uh, you know, for, for both the new rule and the watershed rule uh, inquiries. Uh, you know, I think the, uh, as I was just discussing with Justice Gorsuch, uh, you know, the court in Teague very consciously broke from its past retroactivity jurisprudence, which it found had been too lax uh, and emphasized finality and federalism in adopting the new Teague rule. And I think the reason it did that is it was worried about a large scale disruption disruptions of the state criminal justice system like that would be, you know, worked here. Thank you. Justice Barrett. Good morning, Mr. Michelle. I want to talk to you about accuracy. And the first thing I'd like to ask is a follow-up to your uh, dialogue with Justice Thomas. Um, and, and this is, I think, a point of clarification for me. You were distinguishing between factual accuracy and what I understood you to say would have been the more generous standard of considering the likelihood of wrongful conviction. What is the difference between the two of those, and how is the latter more generous than the former, if I understood you correctly? Well, I, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a tricky question. I had understood some of the, the questions earlier in the argument uh, to, to reflect a view that, uh, you know, there should be a sort of thumb on the scale in favor of the defendant. And so, you know, if, if, you know, if there's twice as likely a risk of, of convicting, uh, a wrong, you know, wrongfully convicting, that should, you know, have outsized risk as compared to not convicting. Um, and, you know, I, I do think it's a sort of difficult abstract question. Uh, but, but as I said to Justice Thomas, I, I don't think that uh, however you resolve that abstract question, it's, it's going to matter here. Well, what then is factual accuracy? Because as you were pointing out, our decisions haven't spoken necessarily with one voice about what the accuracy prong means. So what is factual accuracy as distinguished from the risk of wrongful conviction? Sure. I, I, what I, I, Butler versus McKellar, I think, is a good example. And that was a, a case about excluding a, uh, a, a confession or uh, defendant statements after he had requested a lawyer. And the court said, you know, it actually might uh, contribute to factual accuracy to have the statements in because we would know more about what actually happened. Uh, of course, if you were worried about wrongful convictions, uh, then I think you, you might have a different view of that. Uh, but but certain, no matter how you, you cash out that uh, somewhat theoretical distinction, uh, I don't think this rises uh, to the level of, of a serious accuracy problem. Thank you. A minute to wrap, wrap up, counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, I, I guess I'd just close by saying, you know, this court's decision in Ramos will have great significance going forward. Uh, but the question before the court today is a different one. Uh, as, as the Ramos plurality noted, it's the Teague doctrine that frees the court to reconsider its constitutional decisions without having uh, the risk of seriously disrupting long final judgments. Uh, and we think that's the right result here. The petitioner was convicted of serious crimes after a full and fair trial. His conviction became final almost a decade ago. To retry him now uh, would require, at a minimum, making his victims relive their trauma. And in many other cases, a retrial might not be possible, uh, causing uh, disruptive effects in both the federal and the state systems. We think this is a heartland case for the application of the Teague Bar. The petitioner's final convictions should remain final. Thank you. Mr. Belanger, rebuttal? Unanimity and reasonable doubt are two doctrines that work hand-in-hand hand to assure that we have a fair and accurate judicial system. Gideon, Winship, and Ramos all point us to the realization that it is the legitimate risk of inaccuracy within the system that matters. As this court said in Ballou, the risk of sending 10 innocent people to jail is greater than the risk of sending one guilty person free. Apodaca was an opinion that was dead on arrival because it predicated its decisive vote on analysis that was foreclosed by precedent at the time it was decided. 
Ramos removed this uncomfortable thorn from the side of our legal system, and as such, it became a unique case which falls on a line that checks the boxes as being both an old rule and a new rule. First, Ramos is an old rule. It ignores uh, it. It has uh, followed pre-existing precedent that was logically dictated by uh, the case law that preceded it. Ultimately, the state fails to dispute that jury unanimity and incorporation of the jury trial right are deeply rooted in American jurisprudence. Let's be clear, Ramos did not break any new ground under Teague. Second, for members of this court who viewed Apodoc as precedent, Ramos announced a watershed rule of criminal procedure. The state does not meaningfully address the parallels between Ramos and Gideon. Both decisions restored bedrock Sixth Amendment principles, and both decisions compelled outlier states to apply rights they previously refused to recognize. A conviction can only be legally accurate if the state proves this case beyond a reasonable doubt of all jurors. The expressly racist origin of non-unanimous juries also contravene any state interest in finality and repose. Since Ramos, members of this court have recognized that the original motivation for the laws mattered, notwithstanding any subsequent re-ratification. The same is true here. In the end, the state has no legitimate interest in avoiding retroactivity, but for its desire to let Mr. Edwards languish in Angola for the rest of his life. On what grounds can we let this happen when we know his conviction is unconstitutional? The answer to that question is none. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, counsel. Uh, The case is submitted.